Hello and welcome to this Biology 101 course where we are using the OpenStax text concepts of biology that you can see behind me. And in this series of videos, I will be doing a casual read through of the textbook. Now the OpenStax series is uh, produced by Rice University in collaboration with a lot of other universities. It is um, a series of textbooks that is free. Uh, the electronic version is, donations are encouraged. And uh, this is me coming through this uh, book in a way that's not going to be exactly the same as the lectures, but uh, will probably be in more detail. So here we go with chapter one, Introduction to Biology, again in the book Concepts of Biology. So viewed from space, Earth offers few clues about the diversity of life forms that reside there. The first forms of life on Earth are thought to have been microorganisms that existed for billions of years before plants and animals appeared. The mammals, birds, and flowers so familiar to us are relatively recent, originating 130 to 200 million years ago. Humans have inhabited this planet for only the last 2.5 million years. And only in the last 200,000 years have humans started looking like we do today. So 1.1, Themes and Concepts of Biology. By the end of this section, you will be able to identify and describe the properties of life, describe the levels of organization among living things, list examples of different subdisciplines in biology. Biology is the science that studies life. What exactly is life? This may sound like a silly question with an obvious answer, but it is not easy to define life. For example, a branch of biology called virology studies viruses, which exhibit some of the characteristics of living entities but lack others. It turns out, although viruses can attack living organisms, cause disease, and even reproduce, they do not meet the criteria that biologists use to define life. Now, in biology, uh, it is not a it is not universally decided that we absolutely can't call viruses alive that's a more subjective opinion and uh, some biologists certainly do consider viruses alive though i'm not one of them because as i mentioned in lecture that would bring up the question of prions if a virus is alive so it has rna or dna but it can't reproduce on its own what about the prion, which is a misfolded chaperone protein that is able to misfold other proteins to be like itself? It certainly is reproducing using a host cell, but uh, we don't generally call them alive. From its earliest beginnings, biology has wrestled with four questions. What are the shared properties that make something alive? How do the various living things function? When faced with the remarkable diversity of life, how do we organize the different kinds of organisms so that we can better understand them? And finally, what biologists ultimately seek to understand, how did this diversity arise and how is it continuing? As new organisms are discovered every day, biologists continue to seek answers to these and other questions. All groups of living organisms share several key characteristics or functions. Order, sensitivity or response to stimuli, reproduction, adaptation, growth and development, regulation, homeostasis, and energy processing. When viewed together, these eight characteristics serve to define life. Organisms are highly organized structures that consist of one or more cells. Even very simple single-celled organisms are remarkably complex. Inside each cell, Atoms make up molecules. These in turn make up cell components or organelles. Multicellular organisms, which may consist of millions of individual cells, have an advantage over single-celled organisms in that their cells can be specialized to perform specific functions and even sacrificed in certain situations for the good of the organism as a whole. How these specialized cells come together to form organs such as the heart, lung, or skin in organisms, like in the toad shown here, will be discussed later. So the basic hierarchy of what comprises an organism 
is as pictured here with atoms, molecules, to cells, tissues, organs, organisms, or organs to organ systems. So to be alive, we also need to uh, exhibit some kind of a sensitivity and or response to stimuli. Organisms respond to diverse stimuli. For example, plants can bend towards a source of light or respond to touch, which is uh, this fern indicated here. Even tiny bacteria can move towards or away from chemicals, a process called chemotaxis, or light, phototaxis. Movement towards a stimulus is considered a positive response, while movement away from a stimulus is considered a negative response. Reproduction. Single-celled organisms reproduce by first duplicating their DNA, which is the genetic material, and then dividing it equally as the cell prepares to divide to form two new cells. Many multicellular organisms, those made up of more than one cell, produce specialized reproductive cells that will form a new individual. When reproduction occurs, DNA containing genes is passed along to an organism's offspring. These genes are the reason that the offspring will belong to the same species and will have characteristics similar to the parent, such as fur color and blood type. Pictured here is the life cycle of the corn smut Eustilago matus. Adaptation. All living organisms exhibit a fit to their environment. Biologists refer to this fit as adaptation, and it is a consequence of evolution by natural selection, which operates in every lineage of reproducing organisms. Examples of adaptations are diverse and unique, from heat-resistant archaea that live in boiling hot springs to the tongue length of nectar feeding moss that match the size of the flower from which it feeds. All adaptations enhance the reproductive potential of the individual exhibiting them, including their ability to survive and reproduce. Adaptations are not constant. As the environment changes, natural selection causes the characteristics of the individuals in a population to track those changes. Pictured here is the uh, red ant mimic. Uh, it's a jumping spider that is uh, able to hide itself in amongst red ants and, you know, feed amongst them. Another requirement for life is the ability to grow and develop. Organisms grow and develop according to specific instructions coded for by their genes. These genes provide instructions that will direct cellular growth and development, ensuring that a species young, as these kittens are illustrated here, will grow up to exhibit many of the same characteristics as its parents. Regulation. Even the smallest organisms are complex and require multiple regulatory mechanisms to coordinate internal functions, such as the transport of nutrients, response to stimuli, and coping with environmental stresses. For example, organ systems such as the digestive or circulatory systems perform specific functions like carrying oxygen throughout the body, removing waste, delivering nutrients to every cell, and cooling the body. Pictured here is an example of a uh, cartoon for a regulatory network. Uh, it's from the work of these guys in 2002. And this is lipid metabolism, homeostasis. To function properly, cells require additional conditions such as proper temperature, pH, and concentrations of diverse chemicals. These conditions may, however, change from one moment to the next. Organisms are able to maintain internal conditions within a narrow range almost constantly, despite environmental changes through a process called homeostasis, or steady state. The ability of an organism to maintain constant internal conditions. For example, many organisms regulate their body temperatures in a process known as thermoregulation. Organisms that live in a cold climate, uh, such as the polar bear, uh, they have body structures that help them withstand low temperatures and conserve body heat. In hot climates, organisms have methods such as perspiration in humans or panting in dogs to help them shed excessive body heat. Instead of the picture of the polar bear, what I brought you here is an example of homeostasis in our blood. So our blood pH is basically maintained by breathing. Uh, drinking alkaline whatever is not going to alter your body's pH. It's just not going to do it. If it could, we'd be in dire straits, and I don't think we'd exist as a species if it was that easy to change 
our blood's pH by just eating something. So yeah, blood, bu blood our blood is buffered and it is buffered bu and it is buffered quite effectively. Energy processing. All organisms, such as the California condor shown in this figure, use a source of energy for their metabolic activities. Some organisms capture energy from the sun and convert it into chemical energy in food. Others use chemical energy from molecules they take in. Levels of organization of living things. Living things are highly organized and structured following a hierarchy of scale from small to large. The atom is the smallest and most fundamental unit of matter. It consists of a nucleus surrounded by electrons. Atoms form molecules. A molecule is a chemical structure consisting of at least two atoms held together by a chemical bond. Many molecules that are biologically important are macromolecules, large molecules that are typically formed by combining smaller units called monomers. An example of a macromolecule is deoxyribonucleic acid, which contains instructions for the functioning of the organism that contains it. Some cells contain aggregates of macromolecules surrounded by membranes. These are called organelles. Organelles are small structures that exist within cells and perform specialized functions. All living things are made of cells. The cell itself is the smallest fundamental unit of structure and function in living organisms. This requirement is why viruses are not considered living. They are not made of cells. To make new viruses, they have to invade and hijack a living cell. Only then can they obtain the materials they need to reproduce. Some organisms consist of a single cell and others are multicellular. A cells are classified as prokaryotic or eukaryotic. Prokaryotes are single-celled organisms that lack organelles surrounded by a membrane and do not have nuclei surrounded by nuclear membranes. In contrast, the cells of eukaryotes do have membrane-bound organelles and nuclei. Now, prokaryotes uh, essentially means a first cell, and uh, this includes archaea and bacteria, and then eukaryotes, uh, that means new cells, include all the cells that have uh, organelles. Uh, that's one of the most fundamental differences. In most multicellular organisms, cells combine to make tissues, which are groups of similar cells carrying out the same function. Organs are collections of tissues grouped together based on common function. Organs are present not only in animals, but also in plants. An organ system is a higher level of organization that consists of functionally related organs. For example, vertebrate animals have many organ systems, such as the circulatory system that transports blood throughout the body and uh, to and from the lungs. It includes organs such as the heart and blood vessels. Organisms are individual living entities. For example, uh, each tree in a forest is an organism. single cell prokaryotes and single cell eukaryotes are also considered organisms and are typically referred to as microorganisms. All right, so uh, you can ignore the prokaryotes and eukaryotes in here because that's not, these are all the terms I just described. Now when we speak about, no, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait to talk about that. All the individuals of a species living within a specific area are collectively called a population. For example, a forest may include many white pines. All of these pine trees represent the population of white pine trees in, the, in this forest. Different populations may live in the same specific area. For example, the forest with the pine trees includes populations of flowering plants and also insects and microbial populations. A community is a set of populations inhabiting a particular area. For instance, all of the trees, flowers, insects, and other populations in a forest form the forest's community. The forest itself is an ecosystem. An ecosystem consists of all the living things in a particular area together with the abiotic, non-living, uh, parts of that environment such as nitrogen in the soil or rainwater. At the highest level of organization, a biosphere is the collection of all ecosystems and represents the zones of life on Earth. This includes land, water, and portions of the atmosphere. Oh, here we go. There's a little diagram running right up through there. Okay, and uh, so here's a little participatory part. What is the smallest organism? Oh, look, Mycoplasma 
genitalium. So this will um, infect the urogenital tract and uh, it is incredibly small at 200 to 300 nanometers. So that's why it's sometimes referred to as an ultra microbacterium. Now the largest organism may surprise you. It is uh, the honey fungus, which can be, uh, there is one of them uh, that is 2.4 miles across in the Blue Mountains of Oregon. You thought I was going to say whale or something, maybe. I don't know. I couldn't get anyone in class to, to, to give me a guess. All right, the diversity of life. The science of biology is very broad in scope because there is tremendous diversity of life on Earth. The source of diversity is evolution, the process of gradual change during which new species arise from old species. Evolutionary biologists studying the evolution of living things in everything from the microscopic world to ecosystems. In the 18th century, a scientist named Carl Linnaeus first proposed organizing the known species of organisms into a hierarchical taxonomy. In this system, the species are the most similar to each other and are put together within a grouping known as a genus. Furthermore, similar genera are put together within a family. This grouping continues up until all organisms are collected together into groups at the highest level. The current taxonomic system now has eight levels in its hierarchy. From lowest to highest, they are species, genus, family, order, class, phylum, kingdom, domain. Thus, species are grouped within genera, genera are grouped within families, families are grouped within orders, and so on. Now, there are also uh, sub phyla and subclasses and there are some more discrete divisions within it but in general it's uh we stick to the eight levels uh, until you get into some specific work maybe with some specific organism or decide to become a taxonomist yourself now the highest level uh, domain is a relatively new addition to the system since the 1990s so if you're as old as i am the 1990s is still pretty recent some of y'all were um Scientists now recognize three domains of life, the eukarya, the archaea, and the bacteria. The domain eukarya contains organisms that have cells with the nuclei. It includes the kingdoms of fungi, plants, animals, and several kingdoms of protists. The archaea are single-celled organisms without nuclei that include many extremophiles that live in harsh environments like hot springs. The bacteria are another quite different group of single-celled organisms without nuclei. Uh, both the archaea and the bacteria are prokaryotes, an informal name for cells without nuclei. The recognition in the 1990s that certain bacteria, now known as the archaea, were as different genetically and biochemically from the other bacterial cells as they were from eukaryotes, motivated the recommendation to divide life into three domains. This dramatic change in our knowledge of the tree of life demonstrates that classifications are not permanent and will change when new information becomes available. In addition to the hierarchical taxonomic system, Linnaeus was the first to name organisms using two unique names, now called the binomial naming system. Before Linnaeus, the use of common names to refer to organisms caused confusion because there were regional differences in these common names. Binomial names consist of the genus name, which is capitalized, and the species name, all lowercase. Both names are set in italics, when they are printed, where you can use italics, unlike, uh, you know, social media, where you can't. Every species is given a unique binomial, which is recognized the world over so that a scientist in any location can know which organism is being referred to. For example, the North American blue jay is known uniquely as Cyanicida cristata. Our own species is Homo sapiens. So, um... I did tell the class this, but if you're not sure the pronunciation of a name, uh, you can fake your way through it. And uh, if you say it with confidence, most people will believe you. Uh, I think I just butchered that poor Blue Jay's name. Cyanocida Cristata. That sounds like a dish. Sounds like something you would order. Oh, well. All right. Whoa. Whoa. All right, so um, here are some representatives of our various domains as, yeah, pictured there. Great. The evolutionary relationships of various life forms on Earth can be summarized in a phylogenetic tree. 
A phylogenetic tree is a diagram showing the evolutionary relationships among biological species based on similarities and differences in genetic or physical traits or both. Uh, more so genetic now uh, than phenotypic traits. A phylogenetic tree is composed of, a, of branch points or nodes and branches. The internal nodes represent ancestors and are points in evolution when, based on scientific evidence, an ancestor is thought to have diverged to form two new species. The length of each branch can be considered as estimates of relative time. In the past, biologists grouped living organisms into five kingdoms, animal, plants, fungi, protists, and bacteria. The pioneering work of American microbiologist Carl Woese in the early 1970s has shown, however, that life on Earth has evolved along three lineages. As previously mentioned, uh, these are the domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Woese proposed the domain as a new taxonomic level and archaea as a new domain to reflect the new phylogenetic tree. Many organisms belonging to the archaea domain live under extreme conditions and are called extremophiles. To construct his tree, Woes used genetic relationships rather than similarities based on morphology. Various genes were used in phylogenetic studies. Uh, Woes' tree was constructed from comparative uh, sequencing of the genes that are universally distributed, found in some slightly altered form in every organism, conserved, meaning that the genes have remained only slightly changed throughout evolution, and of an appropriate length. Branches of biological study. The scope of biology is broad and therefore contains many branches and subdisciplines. Biologists may pursue those subdisciplines and work in a more focused field. For instance, molecular biology studies biological processes at the molecular level, including interactions among molecules such as DNA, RNA, and proteins, as well as the way they are regulated. Microbiology is the study of the structure and function of microorganisms, it is a quite broad branch itself, and depending on the subject of study, there are also microbial physiologists, ecologists, and geneticists, among others. Okay, editorially here, um, you're not going to get away from molecular biology in, uh, in microbiology. That's going to be part of your work. There's really, that's just kind of how it is. These are ba like basic tools. Another field of biological study, neurobiology, studies the biology of the nervous system. And although it is considered a branch of biology, it is also recognized as an interdisciplinary field of study known as neuroscience. Because of its interdisciplinary nature, this subdiscipline studies different functions of the nervous system using molecular, cellular, developmental, medical, and computational approaches. That has nothing to do with this figure. This figure is uh, showcasing paleontology. Another branch of biology uses fossils to study life's history. Zoology and botany are the study of animals and plants, respectively. Biologists can also specialize as biotechnologists, ecologists, or physiologists, to name just a few areas. Biotechnologists apply the knowledge of biology to create useful products. Ecologists study the interactions of organisms in their environments. Physiologists study the workings of cells, tissues, and organs. This is just a small sample of the many fields that biologists can pursue. From our own bodies to the world we live in, discoveries in biology can affect us in very different and important ways. We depend on these discoveries for our health, our food sources, and the benefits provided by our ecosystem. Because of this, knowledge of biology can benefit us in making decisions in our day-to-day -day lives. The development of technology in the 20th century that continues today, particularly the technology to describe and manipulate the genetic material, DNA, has transformed biology. This transformation will allow biologists to continue to understand the history of life in greater detail, how the human body works, our human origins, and how humans can survive as a species uh, on this planet, despite the stresses caused by our increasing numbers. Biologists continue to decipher huge mysteries about life, suggesting that we have only begun to understand life on this planet, its history, and our relationship to it. For this and other reasons, the knowledge of biology gained through this textbook and other printed and electronic media should be a benefit in whatever field you enter. 
And highlighted here, we have uh, forensic science. So it's the application of science to answer questions related to the law. Okay, now join me next time when we get into the second part of this chapter, the process of science. And uh, that's where I'm going to stop this video. So until next time.